Aloha, welcome to another Mama Presents. Oftentimes people say to me, where do you find your guests? Well, yesterday I got an email from a friend, Gary Schubach. Dr. Gary Schubach works here in the area of, I guess, defined sexology. He's a, a doctor that gets involved with people in different issues they have. And he sent me an email that talked about someone coming to the island was an associate and friend of his. This is Liana Wolf. Hi, thanks for inviting me. I was intrigued when he described you as a sexual anthropologist. Do um, you know Gary a lot of years now? I've known him quite a few years, yeah. And um, a sexual anthrop I would well, never describe him as that. Well, no. I, the, the reason I'm what I am and he's what, who he is is that I have a, a graduate degree in anthropology and I became a sexologist um, later. And so I have a doctorate in sexology and I teach anthropology and do sexological research and much of my research is informed with an anthropological perspective. And I also, like Gary, do see clients and often address similar kinds of things that he does, but at the same time I also have a lot of facility in talking to people about things that involve culture and tr cross-cultural um, situations. Well, that's what intrigued me yeah. last night when the subject of his email, or as he was talking, was the difference between polygamy and cheaters, mm -hmm. and that Dr. Liana Wolf was coming, and like I said, of the history of that, and I thought, well, let's see, let me see if I can describe it, and then I'll let you help okay, fine tune. Sure. Is that okay, all right? Sure. Polygamy is um, people that are married or in strong direct relationship with more than one partner. Well, polygamy um, by definition is a multiple person marriage. And there's okay. two kinds of polygamy around the world. There's polygyny, which is a husband with multiple wives. And then there's polyandry, which is a wife with multiple husbands. And I also do research on something called polyamory, which is a Western version of that, where we don't, in most Western parts of the world, formally allow multiple person marriages, but we certainly have people who have reason to have consensual multiple partner relationships. I see. And generally, does it imply sex? Generally, it does. Okay, and it can also, as I saw last night, it can mean children and a different upbringing than... Sure, yeah, and yeah, I mean, certainly all across the world, I would say around 85% of the cultures in the world allow polygamy, and so children are, of course, being raised in multiple adult households. 85% of the cultures, of the cultures, in, the cultures world in the world allow yeah. polygamy. And how... Would you say it's practiced in most of those cultures, some of those cultures, well, and how much? Well, when it comes down to population, it's about a third of the world's population wow. is actually in, living in a culture where this is practiced. Because the reason why we have the 85% number is that many of those cultures are very small. And so, um, as for the Western world, which makes up much of the world population, we typically don't allow polygamy. In Muslim co countries it's allowed. A under Islam a man can have up to four wives. If no, but the polyandry version does not happen? Polyandry is very, very rare. Polyandry is with a wife with multiple husbands, and we see that in about 0.5% of cultures. Well, okay. That's quite different. That's yeah. a and, and when you think about it, it all comes down to economics. Because the reason why um, multiple males would share a wife is because they're brothers and they have a family farm that they want to keep intact, like the New England Tibet. And as a result, they don't, if they were to each marry a separate woman, they'd have to subdivide their farm. And then it would be less prosperous. And on the other end of it, in terms of um, money and um, resources, the man who can afford multiple wives does so as a means of expressing prestige and status. In our country, we don't legally allow men to have multiple wives, so they could 
practice serial monogamy and get divorced and remarried and continually marry younger, hotter women like Donald Trump does. They're just a revolving door plan. Yeah, but <laughs> um, in a country like Africa, a man might start with one wife in his um, early 20s once he has some property and then once he acquires more property he can afford more wives and ultimately afford to take care of all the children that would be produced. So historically throughout the world it's been, have there been an American historic, <laughs> is there a track in America? that? Well Mar America is a really unique context because America is probably the first really big experiment in monogamy. Because oh. before all of this, um, in Europe, what would happen in the Middle Ages um, and later, men who were the inheritors of the family name and the family property were the ones, and the family business were the ones who were able to marry. And the younger brothers were sent to convents or were just like left to be troubadours and they couldn't, there was no resources for them to marry. But in America, because Indian rights weren't respected, we, all kinds of European men, came to America, were given land, and thus, whether they were a firstborn or any born, they could um, have a farm and have their own wives. Wow, I see. So really, uh, to me, it's interesting how anthropology and sociology <coughs> and all this form together. Mm -hmm. That's that we were talking about yeah. in my degree. Yeah. Social science is interdisciplinary. Right, exactly. How much it really is a, a whole bunch of different factors. Sure. Yeah. Um, here in America, have you seen, um, I don't know what it is to call it, polygamy? Okay. Uh, I, the Mormonism, for example. Yeah. I think well, about the, Mormon. Yeah, there are, um, uh, there's a discrete sect of Mormons called the um, fundamentalist um, members of the Church of Latter-day Saints who do um, follow what they recognize as scripture and practice polygamy. And at the, this moment there may be um, 50 to 60,000 of them who do so. But most members of the Mormon Church are not polygamists. When in 1890 when Utah joined the Union, one of the agreements is that they would stop practicing polygamy. And by and large they do. But there are pockets of practitioners of polygamy. And some of them live in towns around Utah, in Idaho, in um, Air, northern Arizona. Well, it's interesting because I um, happened to meet a, a young lady who was there last night, right. in fact, mm -hmm. who was married and part of the mm -hmm. Mormon faith mm -hmm. and then um, left and had a whole big story. Yeah. And she had a really interesting story. Largely, um, she had really developed, a, at one level, an appetite for community by being raised in a large family with um, many mothers, her biological mother and the, all the other co-wives that her mother had, and really found that to be, in many ways, really practical and useful. But in terms of being a woman and to only be able to have share her husband with um, and see him infrequently and not have all the um, erotic expression she might choose, it became unpalatable for her. And in many of the, the um, in patriarchal polygamous cultures, they wouldn't dream of a woman having sexual appetite and wanting to realize it. And so that's one of the really unique things about polyamory. It, which is, you know, the, our informal Western version of multiple partners, I where see. we have large, as large a number of women as men who are involved and who are, ha, themselves have multiple partners. The internet, new mm -hmm. on the scene, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. uh, now I guess it's two decades. Mm -hmm. More and more things, I mean, my mailbox has, I don't know, three to five a day. Different people trying to get a Christian, schmingle, mingle, mm -hmm. Jewish, you name it. Mm -hmm. They're out there. Uh, there's a, a site, Ashley Madison mm -hmm. even, who does a uh, 
a site you were mentioning last night yeah, that you've done yeah, a little study. I, yeah, Ashley Madison invited me to um, manage the large subscriber base, put up a, a survey. They're a site that enables married people to find other married she with. So married and married, that's yeah. what they do? Right. And um, and their thinking behind this, in term, and, and obviously there's many people who agree with them, who have joined up in one fashion or another, is, is that both people would have as much to lose, and thus they wouldn't try to um, bring down each other's marriages. Because, you know, if you're a married person and you start having an affair with a single person, that single person might um, at some point want to destroy your marriage and get and get you to marry them. I but see. if yeah. both people have much at stake in terms of not wanting to rock the boat at home, wanting to keep things intact, wanting to keep their children, wanting to keep their property, really not wanting the financial challenges of a divorce. Now, you know, we met, talked about Donald Trump. He can afford to. Most people can't. And so this way, they're at some level getting the best of both worlds. They're getting to keep their marriages, and they're less frustrated, and so that because they are finding um, sexual expression outside of their marriage. Something just raced into my head that somehow that remember there was a movie with uh, Alan Alda and uh, Elliot Gould, and oh, uh, Ellen, Alan. Ellen Burstyn. There were a couple of them. There was Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. Okay. And then there was uh, Same Time Next Year. Right. Though, I remember but, Same Time Next Year. Yeah. Right. And um, I thought to myself, those were subjects that were They've similar been subject, for a while. right? Yeah. And Same Time Next Year, bo both honored the relationship she had and also gave her a little space to be um, somebody else. So that was polyamory? Well, Not really. that, was, uh, that was that was cheating. It was a private okay. arrangement. I mean, it was in the movie didn't make it look like it was a bad thing to be doing. It was maybe a spiritual and erotic uh, enhancement for the people who saw each other once every year. Right. And and basically they respected what else was going on in each other's lives and Good example yeah. of, of responsibly done. Yeah. Okay. And you know, and most people who would be getting on Matt Ashley Madison want to do it responsibly, in the way that they don't want to rock any boats. No boat rocking. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, it's such a big subject. And you know, when you think about human brain chemistry, most people are probably happiest when they have a mix of things going on in their brains. They're both settled and secure in their home relationship, and they're excited about something. And this something, you know, could be new projects or it could be a new lover. I'm sure that the internet pornography is probably a surrogate, and I don't say so, a surrogate <laughs> for a replacement of a partner physically. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. enhancement to... Mm -hmm someone's appreciation. Yeah, probably right? more at the level of lust because they're not really having an interactive experience. So they wouldn't typically be falling in love with each other, but they would um, nonetheless be, um, as we might say, getting off. Well, it's interesting how you last night described different kinds, I would say different kinds of love or stages, mm -hmm. I'm right, not sure. Right, right. Lust and then... Attraction, attraction. and then attachment. And attraction is... Um, the phase that we write all our love songs and movies about. <laughs> so this is where you can't get enough of them, where you want to see them forever and ever and ever, where um, you and they um, need to ride off into the sunset together and never, never lose each other. Yeah. And how long does that phase last? Well, we, you know, if somebody's seeing each other all the time, it could burn out fairly quick. If they have adult responsibilities, it might last a year and a half. And then what? And then we typically cycle into attachment if we stay in the relationship. Because there's, you know, usually a turnaround where people then look at each other and say, who are you? And do I, what, what are we doing together? And do we have anything in common now that the... Um, now that the is, thrill is gone. Yeah. Right. And <laughs> yeah. some people ultimately decide they don't. Other people, um, you know, re create the relationship in such a way that it's a really meaningful relationship, but it's not going to have the sparkle of a new relationship. And some people have 
um, an appetite for the brain chemistry that's part of a new relationship. That brain chemistry is typically dopamine. And you can get a dopamine rush from all kinds of things, from shooting hard drugs, from um, falling in love with somebody new. And you can do a combination. I would think that if one enhanced one's old relationship, right, and you're gonna get yeah, got that's the new, yeah, it's sort of yeah, a mixed so bouquet could, and help the right, old sure, relationship yeah. build. Yeah, in some and way. that is what peop many people endeavor to do. And sometimes the reasons couples fight is so that they can make up. And then when they make up, they ex get excited again about a new person and a new, a newly created thing. I see. That's an interesting mm -hmm. aspect. In this Christendom, I say that only because the dominant religion mm -hmm. being Christian, mm -hmm. which talks about monogamy. Mm -hmm. you know, let's say the churches talk about it. Right. I don't know because I haven't really done a healthy research into the Bible. The Bible reference anything like that? Well, actually, what's really interesting is if you look back to the fourth century, um, the Christian Church uh, in Europe, actually the Catholic Church, um, made a declaration that divorce would be banned, that adoption would be banned, that taking second wives would be banned, and what was behind all of this was not a moral thing. But an economic thing. I'm just waiting a second here. We're sitting along Baldwin Avenue. We might have been up in Haiku, but we're here in Lower Makwao at Rainbow Park, which is a beautiful spot. Isn't it, it is. It is. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Back to your story. <coughs> okay. You so fourth century, fourth in, century in um, old Europe, Catholic Church, um, creating all kinds of decrees about what people could no longer do. They could no longer adopt. They could no longer keep concubines. They could no longer take second wives. They could no longer divorce and remarry. What was behind all of this? Preventing families from creating male heirs. Because if heirs were created, those heirs would inherit the family wealth. The church wanted people's money. And so if they created all these things and people actually went along with them, they could, when a, a, a head of a family passed on, his, his family's wealth, being that women didn't inherit, would go to the church. And so the church became the largest landholder in all of Europe. This had nothing to do with morality. It had to do with making the church rich. So back to the Bible for a moment. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were all polygamists. They were all polygamists, right? Yeah. That was uh, the norm, and that's Adam been and the Eve norm and all, it's for been humans norm. to... And you know, when you even look at X and Y chromosome distribution in our species, there is much less variation in the Y chromosome than the X chromosome. There were fewer fathers of our species than there were mothers because many of the men had multiple wives. Has it been somehow created socially through law? Or has it been created, how did this, we end up in this? Monogamy? Well, this whole thing that you're talking about that people would have land and so they'd be able to afford <coughs> to have a wife. Right. And so that was a new... So this was a new thing in America because there was this wide open country. Indian land rights, as I said before, were not recognized. And thus all kinds of European men came to America and could have their own homestead. They could have their own farm. And thus they could afford to each have their own families. They Rather could afford than, to have multiple wives. How did no, that, I mean the multiple wife thing um, was something that rich men did. I and see. So many was, men didn't have the ability financially to have a wife at all. Even here. I'm well, no here, get, no here. No here. Where no, did okay, it get that? Le, was it legislated? In? No. Well, basically, it was just an opportunity here because men were migrating from Europe. These might have, you know, were the firstborn of a family, inherited all the family wealth, and he could have a wife and a family. His younger brothers could not. They were off on their own. They might get thrown into convents. They might um, just wander around and be troubadours and write poetry and have affairs with women, but they um, could not marry because they had no wealth. And here, it was completely different because there was all this farmland that um, European men be, came here and could take. And thus each of them could have his own wife. 
first time in history we ever saw anything like this. Prior, it was always polygyny. Well, polygyny, again, I'm, I'm going to try to separate out, because the next thing that came to my mind, it seems to be male choice, right? Mm -hmm. The man will have multiple wives, not honoring in any way that the woman might have sexual appetite, but mm -hmm. also an interest in creating her own life. It really mm -hmm. was a different society. Yeah. Well, actually, if you look at the history of marriage, it was, it's been a cycle where there have been times where women's sexuality has been seen as very potent and that women needed to be controlled through things like chastity belts and um, genital um, mutilations and other times um, in much of uh, Elizabethan England, women were seen as very um, sexy and having a higher sex drive than men. And it was only in the Victorian times that women were seen as having very little sex drive and that ma a man married to a woman would only have sex with her to have children, but otherwise he'd be with prostitutes because he, his own wife was too delicate for that. You know, another thing you mentioned I thought was interesting was how uh, you identified uh, an orthodox religious group as having used prostitutes where other categories of people didn't have Yeah, that well, basically, kind of... we had this really interesting um, set of questions on our survey. We had done a survey that had a really innocuous title, which is called the Sex and Relationship Happiness Survey. Huh. And um, so we... Under that, we could ask a variety of different questions. How many people did you think you had in your study? About 7,000. Okay. And um, one of the things we um, asked about was um, whether they, the respondents felt that they um, were having more the same or less oral sex than other people, other couples. Right. And the men, by and large, said that other men were having more. Okay. And then, and one of the things I was looking at in terms of the sample of people who responded was that these were people who, um, when we asked them, well, what are you going to do about it if this is the case? Um, and most of the men said they would just let it go and focus on other things. But somewhere around 17 or so percent of the men said they would go um, have an affair. Or if they were polyamorous, they would go find a secret lover. And I was comparing this to, um, and you know, and then when it came down to would they pay a prostitute for oral sex? And in some communities, this is very common. Like as I was mentioning, Orthodox Jews, working yeah. class Hispanics, they wouldn't think of um, getting emotionally involved in somebody for sex. They simply want a particular sex act. They pay um, somebody um, in their community who is a known um, prostitute, and they get their needs satisfied. But this group we were looking at, they're really interested in relationship. They're interested in, um, if they're a man, having um, their genitals honored. They want to feel like they're with somebody who cares. And so the thought of paying somebody to act like they care or go through the motions of a caring act didn't feel right to them. They um, wanted to do it with somebody who was attracted to them, who they felt attracted to. And it was mostly sexual orientation. I mean, if someone was having a bad relationship, do they often think that sex is going to be the cure? Or you well, get into that kind of a thing? Yeah, well, basically, what, we're, what we were finding with these, these people is at least 40% of the men on the Ashley Madison site said that they were, let me think, they were happy in their home relationships. They were in love with their wives. They were having regular sex with them. There was really no problem. 
Why were they on the site? They were on the site just checking out what else was out there. Hmm. Where the women on the site, completely different story. The women were on the site because they were unhappy at home. They wanted more than they could get sexually from their husbands. They were no longer, their husbands, there was, you know, probably deep relationship issues. And they nonetheless had reasons to stay in their marriages. Maybe they were financial reasons. Maybe they were children that they didn't want to um, separate from their father. And maybe there was a family home that because of the recession they couldn't afford to sell. But Whatever never, the reason was. But you never really isolated the men. For, <laughs> I'm just asking, for example, there's women having challenge in their relationships sexually, maybe financially, uh -huh. we don't really exactly okay. know, okay. right? But men, men that were having challenge in their relationship, I'm wondering if they uh, reached out in that same way. It's an well, the, no, it's, it's different. The, the site, as I could see it, attracts women who have already had affairs and want more affairs and want to have it in a you know pretty much no strings attached kind of way they don't they're unlike polyamorous people they don't want to get super involved they're looking for men that um would like um more sex and the men um are often reporting that their marriages are in good shape and they just want a wider variety of sexual expression than they're getting at home this polyamory where someone has multiple partners, mm -hmm. might that be an area where more men... I'm, I'm looking at the different kinds of things. So that seems like a site where a woman can find many willing partners if she's mm -hmm. willing. Mm -hmm. But a man is a different kind of a relationship with women. Usually, you know, they say the man wears the pants in the family. I think it's not the case. Not so much anymore. <laughs> and so things are really shifting because we're coming into an economic time where in many ca cases women are better educated than men. Women um, make are earning more income than men. At this moment, about 40% of married couples, the women in America, the women earn more than the husbands. Wow. And it's moving more and more towards more prosperous women. And so the whole nature of relationship is really shifting must be interesting for you over these years. It, oh, yeah. It's been a, a very dramatic quick shift. We've been living through this shift. Yeah, back in 1993, I wrote a book called Women Who May Never Marry. And at that point, what had spirited on some of these thoughts was working in the inner city in Los Angeles, in the black community. And there, I was well aware of many more women in college than men. And many of the women really taking, managing their lives independently, having children as they saw fit, raising their children as they saw fit, men were absolutely optional. And then I started noting that more and more of the um, mainstream women of other ethnicities were moving in that direction as well. And what was happening is, is the women were starting to challenge or question how much they wanted to be controlled by men and how much they wanted anyone breathing down their neck. How, and as they were becoming more financially independent, the thought of marriage as um, a way to get things paid for wasn't going to work out for them. And we started migrating into more and more of the notion of partnership marriages. And then we also saw more and more women finding in their, in their supposed process of looking for a mate, they continually found things wrong with a man. And I remember somebody once calling it like the pointy shoe syndrome, where his shoes were too pointed, or whatever it was. It was just the most innocuous things they were finding wrong, because underneath they were really questioning whether they wanted to be in a full-time, day-in, day-out partnership with somebody who um, seemed, in their mind, to be controlling. Uh, I'm... I don't know if I'm just wandering wildly on subjects, but uh, divorce, that was suddenly, it, I remember when they said, most Americans don't get divorced. It was taboo when I was growing up in the 50s. Mm -hmm. It was like a different subject. <coughs> yeah, I remember. And then things so they shifted. shifted. And we had a big shift in um, 
in the 70s. And what brought on that shift was women getting into the workplace. Oh. And so they could see a way to live independently of an unsatisfying marriage. And on top of that, you had um, feminism telling women to believe in themselves and causing more and more women to get a higher education. Were these not subjects that were ever addressed before? Was this a somewhat unique time in the, I guess, sexual anthropology? Well, actually, probably what was the most unique thing was the 50s, when lots of people were getting married. Post-war marriages, high um, optimism after the war, senses of prosperity, where um, a single man's income could fund a household. And, and yet, then, and that, then, from uh, that sprung sprung some very dissatisfied men who all they did was work for the um, livelihood of others and really never actualized themselves. We had women who felt trapped themselves in housework and in not getting to be all else that they wanted to be. And so, basically, the fifties exploded into the sixties, and we had um, sexual revolution, we had feminism, and then that um, led to what you're referring to is a very high divorce rate wave. And the reasons that people aren't getting divorced in such numbers today is they can't afford to. <laughs> that's an interesting perspective, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and that's why they're cheating instead. Because Do you see a to... rise in polyamory being, well, do you see a rise in polyamory right now? A uh, slight rise. Polyamory is really, really challenging for most people because it involves disclosure and involves having an appetite for wanting to hear and share what's going on with other lovers. So the difference between polyamory and cheating, cheating is cheaters is it have partition everything. So a cheater has his lover here and you know his wife there, his business here things don't mess each other up, he hopes, you know, and then, you know, every so often it explodes, like with, um, who was the presidential candidate who had the affair? Uh, it depends which one. Just one. Gary Hart? Ga or, uh, that was way back. That was way, you know, and, so they, you and, had, he uh, said, and when Gary Hart did it, he com his bid for the presidency just blew up, he was out of the campaign, it was over. Right, and then and, there was the guy recently who we all remember as John Edwards. John Edwards. And, then and he, did and he a tried whole... to do this whole major cover up, which just made him look like a, a very manipulative liar to the extent that I think even part of the cover up was getting his campaign manager to claim that he was the father of his lover's child. Yeah. And, um, and this was all under the backdrop of his wife dying of cancer. And so, you know, basically made him look like mud. So, you know. And one of the people that's really interesting in terms of being a, a, a political figure who um, never lied. Let and, me guess. Yeah. Clinton. Well, I was going to say either Bill or Hillary. No, well, Bill Clinton <laughs> no? lied too. Okay, okay. <laughs> no, but the one who didn't is um, somebody named Richard Reardon. He uh. um, used to be the governor of Colorado, and then later he became moved to Los Angeles and became the superintendent of public schools for a while. But while he was in Colorado, the press um, noted that, or claimed that they discovered that he was having an affair. And he says, she's my mistress. My wife knows about it. We have an open relationship. We all enjoy each other. And the story disappeared. Oh, really? Yeah, that was it. It was just like, the, he wasn't lying. There was nothing to be said. There was no controversy. It was all known. Well, that's, a, that's refreshing. Yeah, and <laughs> you know, and then Jesse Jackson is kind of a funny story too because during the time that he was offering Bill Clinton counsel for um, you know having this adulterous affair while president, Jesse Jackson was fathering a child. But what's different about Jesse Jackson is, is that he always recognized the child, always recognized the um, woman who he had the child with, has always supported the child. And so that story also hasn't gotten a lot of attention because he never um, denied anything. Hmm. Well, it's interesting also what gets reported and what isn't. Mm -hmm. and, and it would just as easily 
be reported and maybe to his benefit yeah. and to the family's benefit right. to acknowledge it more and make it more Well, sure. Open. I mean, and that's sort of the thinking behind polyamory is that there should be no secrets. And the more you own exactly who you are and what you're doing and who's in your life, the less stress there is for everyone. And I remember last night there was a young woman who had just had a baby and basically yeah. she um, wants to, was wondering, well, how could she be polyamorous and raise a child? Because she, well, she has an, you know, a father of the child. This man is very, has other connections and he's not going to be with her full time. And so they're certainly not going to do anything that at all looks like traditional monogamy. And she does have other men in her life. And she's wondering, well, um, how do you manage this with a child? And, you know, all I would think is own it. And if the child sees that there's no stress and that there's plenty of love and that the mother isn't disappearing over falling head over heels for somebody else and no longer being the mother, then there should be no problem. Here on Maui, we have a lot of young ladies who have children mm -hmm. and fathers aren't around. Right. For whatever reason. Right. Uh -huh. A similar kind of a thing where in community here in Maui, we have lots of mm -hmm. both intentional and I guess you'd say social communities that are supportive uh, without specific fathers right, being around. Right. Mm -hmm. um, how does that play into communities here in America? I, mean, I don't know because I believe this well, is your first time here, right? Yeah. So, but here we have a, <coughs> a really very loving, mm -hmm. feminine culture. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know some of you. We have masculine, but we have a fair, very inviting, inclusive, mm -hmm. allowing mm -hmm. kind of a culture. Mm -hmm. Is that the kind of thing that becomes a community? Well, that sounds like a, a good basis for a community of what, where you have strong feminine and that it would really kind of give a community its um, grounding. And the masculine, I mean men that are clearly even uninvolved with the females, mm -hmm get involved in a supportive of the young mm -hmm. uh, boys and girls mm -hmm. so that they all so feel very fathered. So do they become like fathered. foster pet fathers or? or um, they become like big brothers big and brothers. foster fathers. Yeah, uh -huh. combo. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. we have a very warm mm -hmm. and loving. So do you have children that you've raised in that way? Do I? No, I do not. No, but in having lived in Maui, are there, no, but are there children familiar. that you have fostered? Yes. Yeah. Um, I have um, been around I had a partner who didn't have children. She was already out and without children. Mm -hmm. But um, you can't imagine I'm over 30, but I am. <laughs> but um, what I found here is that many of the babies that I saw that have grown up in mm -hmm. intentional, loving, mm -hmm. yet single mm -hmm. mother communities mm -hmm. here have very healthy, positive, mm -hmm supported, mm -hmm. strong individuals right. growing up mm -hmm. that have um, a more global and understanding perspective mm -hmm. than more traditionally um, raised yeah. people. I don't know how one studies that, but I can study it from observation only right. on Maui. Mm -hmm. and I've been here now 24 years, right. so I've seen babies become young adults. Sure. So when I was teaching high school in 93, mm -hmm. I was running for mayor in 1904. Mm -hmm. And these little kids, later in my life, I have someone come, you were Mr. Schwartz, my teacher. There's this big, nice. Yeah, <laughs> right. I know it's happened to me uh, many times because I probably at this point have had 6,000 students. Wow. Yeah, because I've been teaching a very long time, I teach college. Wow. Well, you know, I could go on and talk mm -hmm. about different things. Mm -hmm. Well, let me first be sure to, you have a website, I imagine. I do, yeah. What's the web It's address? called drlianawolf.com, D-R-L-E-A-N-N-A, -N -N Wolf, W. Oh, that's a good one. And, uh, oh, that's a good one. And um, do you have your books mentioned there? And I have a lot of you? articles and links there. I wrote a real interesting essay on thoughts about the end of the world that's linked to the front of the site. There's a couple of surveys we're working on, if you take it on the set we're doing a survey on the sexual culture of baby boomers yeah. and if you're happen to be born between 1964 and 1946 there's um, 
an opportunity for you to take that survey and contribute to our research. That was an interesting way you put it. You started with more recent than when ancient. <laughs> yeah, there when you, you said 64, I said, well, I'm not in that. Isn't that interesting? And then you said 19. There I am. Huh? There you are. Yeah, so there's all What makes us baby boomers <coughs> after the war? Huh? After the war, there was a big rise in birth rate. 64, I'm thinking, what was that? The Beatles uh, bringing the music back. Why was that the end? Because that's when yeah, those people grew that's into like, adulthood. -ish. Well, no, um, this is all people that were born. We'll start the other way from between 1946 and 64. That was like a generation. I see. And then there was another generation after that. So then they labeled them X and Gen Y. Gen X and then Gen Y and then, you know, and so we have different generation names that sociologists pin on this, it's trying to <laughs> describe, you know, the conditions and the unique um, challenges and cultures of each of these times. And so the baby boomers had, you know, particular things because it was such a swell of births and the country was so focused on um, post-war child raising. And then, you know, the Gen X children were uh, a much smaller cohort, typically raised uh, or created by people who um, were having children, you know, in the um, late 60s and early 70s. And these were people who were probably not the hippies and not the feminists. These was who were more traditional people who were having their children at that time. And so there were much fewer people born in the Gen X generation because their parents were um, sort of putting one foot in front of the other where all the baby boomers were in, that were, you know, sort of sparked on to be feminists and counterculture people. The, you know, I remember there was a time in Berkeley, I guess it was in the um, 1970s where you would never see uh, a stroller on Telegraph Avenue. You could see very few women were, you know, focusing on self-realization and being mothers. We have such an interesting culture and interesting society, and sex is a big part of it, and mm -hmm. anthropology. I just found that very interesting. Mm -hmm. I've enjoyed this time with you. I'm so glad you have. It's I fun really doing it. think that our audience will get a lot of appreciation of what you're doing. Great. Is there a way is on your website, I'm sure, to get in touch with you, phone yeah. number and everything yeah. else? Yeah. The, we hope uh, that you'll come back here again. Thank you. And um, I invite you when we do our next show or whenever we'll do shows, because we're going to be in the studio here in L.A., all kinds of places. Okay. Well, and uh, you would be a wonderful and welcome guest. And uh, there's so much we could have talked about in so many directions. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to say anything to an audience out there of millions of people or uh, hundreds, what, <laughs> what's an important thing that you would like to really share uh, with them? That um, our notions of relationship and of marriage and of partnership are really changing and that what we used to do is playing out in different ways than, it, than perhaps it ever has before. So, you know, my advice to anyone who's pursuing a relationship or in the midst of a relationship, which is probably all of you, is to be open-minded, be flexible, um, and realize that what used to be may be very different. That's an exciting thing to realize. We all see that in so many aspects of our life. Mm -hmm. Thank you very, very You're much. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure Thank having you. Thank you. People of Maui, people of the world, Dr. Liana Wolf, and I'm Jason Schwartz. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again. Aloha. Aloha. Okay, great.